Well, happy Wednesday. And this being Wednesday, it is officially Poetry Day here on Amelia Island at Story and Song. Now, before I even get into the program I've planned for you today, I have got such a news flash like you wouldn't believe. You know, somebody who we have actually visited with here uh, at Story and Song is Nola Perez. She is a poet of great renown. And she happens to be a very close friend as well. But I do want to tell you something exciting that just happened. Uh, Nola and I and one of her sons, Michael, were at a uh, gathering where we were preparing for something. She had no idea what we were preparing for. But Michael and I and Anthony and Sally and a lot of other people knew exactly why we were rushing her along to get to a certain place. It was because our Bernadina Beach mayor, uh, Johnny, was here and he was giving a proclamation which basically announced some earth-shattering news. Nola Perez is the Poet Laureate officially by mayoral proclamation of Fernandina Beach. Now, isn't that exciting? So, uh, in honor of that, I was talking to Nola. She's got some surgery ahead and some things going on, but as soon as she's feeling up to it, uh, she and I would like to bring you a special program of the Poet Laureate of Fernandina Beach, reading her poems and talking with you right here at the home of local literature, story, and song. Now, I'm off with my, uh, my I'm, I'm back on topic, shall we say. Today, I would like to share with you a wonderful book, The Whale, Whale Day and Other Poems by Billy Collins. This was just released, I believe, last week, and I snapped a copy of it off the shelf so I could go over it, read it, and decide to share it with you. In the opening, there is no official introduction, but, well, I'm wrong. There is a, an introduction, and I'm going to read it to you, but it's in the form of a poem. But even before all that begins, there is something that Charles Kingsley said that is uh, replicated in the very early sections of the book. I love this. Think about these words. No one has a right to say that no water babies exist until they have seen no water babies existing, which is quite a different thing, mine, from not seeing water babies. Hmm. That thought warms me. Now, this is the non-intro intro in the form of a poem, and it is called The Function of Poetry. I woke up early on a Tuesday, made a pot of coffee for myself, then drove down to the village, stopping at the post office, then the bank where I cashed a little check from a magazine. And when I got home, I read some of the newspaper, starting with the science section. And had another cup of coffee and a bowl of cereal. Pretty soon. It was lunchtime. I wasn't at all hungry, but I paused for a moment to look out the big kitchen window. And that's when I realized that the function of poetry 
is to remind me that there is much more to life than what I am usually doing when I'm not reading or writing poetry. And now we get into the body of the poems. Paris in May. A teddy bear in a store window, three house painters waiting to cross a boulevard, a woman in a cafe, her red nails on a man's nape while she smokes. What are we to make of this? In the church of Saint-Sulpice, the virgin holds her baby to her chest as she stands on the round earth. Appearing to be unaware of the serpent, she is crushing with one foot. Outside, four stone lions guard a fountain. Is this a puzzle I am meant to solve before the evening bells ring again? Here, a man wearing a newspaper hat. There, a a child, alone, on a flowery balcony. An outdoor table on Rue Cassette seemed a good enough place to sort things out. And sure enough, after two milky green glasses of Bernot, the crowd flowed around me like a breeze, and I, found a link between my notebook and the soft Parisian sky, both being almost the same pale shade of blue. Life expectancy. On the morning of a birthday that ended in a zero, I was looking out at the garden <laughs> when it occurred to me that the robin on her worm hunt in the dewy grass had a good chance of outliving me, as did the worm itself for that matter, if he managed to keep his worm head down. It was not always like this. For decades, I could assume that I would be around longer than the squirrel dashing up a tree or the nightly raccoons in the garbage, longer than the barred owl on a branch, the ibis, the chicken, and the horse, longer than four deer in a clearing and every creature in the zoo, except the elephant, and the tortoise, whose cages I would hurry past. It was just then in my calculations that the cat padded noiselessly into the room. And it seemed reasonable, given her bright eyes and glossy coat, to picture her at my funeral dressed all in black as usual, which would nicely set off her red collar. Some of the mourners might pause in their grieving to notice as she found a place next to a labradoodle in a section of the church reserved for their kind. Now we're going to have an artful moment. The Floors of Bonnard. Surely the slanted tables are responsible for all the shattered crockery. The puddles of wine and the clumps of butter that must end up on the rarely seen floors in the colorful paintings of Pierre Bonnard. Tilting the table forward in the direction of the viewer is one way to make more visible the red-orange tablecloth. 
and all the objects resting on it, the plates and saucers, the creamer, wine glasses, vases, delicate teacups. But what about the poor wife of Bonar? Why is she never glimpsed amidst all the colorful fabrics, reds, pale blues, and vermilion dots, bearing her broom, her dustpan, and her putrid mop? And now, another point of view. Prospect. I'm high up on a kitchen chair, so I can reach a clear glass vase to put some flowers in and uh, just have a look around. From up here, everything is an aerial drawing of a kitchen with the sink, uh, the stove, oh, and the tall refrigerator, conveying a plummeting sensation as if all their vertical lines ended in hell. Yes, I'm getting a slightly different sense of things from up here, but that's really about it. In fact, I wouldn't recommend this to anyone. Chances are you will feel silly standing on a chair in the kitchen once you have finished whatever it was you climbed up there to do. <sighs> a far cry from the originality of Petrarch, grandfather of the sonnet, who is thought to be the first person known in history to ascend a mountain to the very top just for the sake of a view. Now I got a sidebar. You know I have this tendency. <clears throat> I'm uh, directing a show that uh, opened last Friday called Two Across at ACT. Uh, that's Amelia Community Theater with some live audience and a live streamed audience as well. The reason I interd uh, inter uh, interdict this little uh, bit in here is quite simply, Petrarch makes an appearance in Billy Collins' poem. And guess what? He makes a significant uh, appearance along with his love, Laura, in the play where their relationship and life story is referenced along with those poems, wonderful poems. It's amazing once you start dropping little crumbs of literature around in your life, you'll see where they tend to uh, reappear in the most unexpected places, such as the stage of the Amelia Community Theater. And now back on point. Evening Wind is the title of one of Edward Hopper's pen and ink drawings, which I spent some time looking at in a gallery on the far west side of town. Hopper could have called it Totally Naked Woman Crawling on All Fours in an Unmade Bed, for she does occupy the foreground fully. So it was only later that I noticed the curtains behind her being lifted by what must be an evening wind. Then I noticed that the woman appears to be looking at those curtains. Her face hidden by the dark curtain of her hair? Or is she looking through the curtains at the jagged outline of the city buildings topped with water tanks in silhouettes? It 
was not until I closed my eyes and imagined her gradually falling asleep after sliding naked under the covers that I could envision the evening wind. Oh, not just the, the wind as revealed by the curtains, but the invisible wind itself blowing through the room of this ingeniously titled drawing. Ah, and now I'm going to wet my whistle. with some of story and songs, very good coffee. And I'm going to read you the title poem of Whale Day, Billy Collins. And it goes, today I was awakened by strong coffee and the awareness that the earth is busy with whales, even though we can't see any unless we had embarked on a whale watch, which would be disappointing if we still couldn't see any. I can see the steam rising from my yellow cup, the usual furniture scattered about, and even some early light filtering through the palms. Meanwhile, Thousands of whales are cruising along at various speeds under the seas, crisscrossing one another, salmon in and out of the Gulf Stream, some with their calves traveling alongside. Such big blunt heads they have. So it is too much to ask that one day a year be set aside for keeping in mind while we step onto a bus, consume a hand sandwich, or stoop to pick up a coin from a sidewalk. The multitudes of these mammoth creatures coasting between continents, some for the fun of it, others purposeful in their journeys, all concealed under the sea, unless somewhere one breaks the surface with an astonishing upheaval of water and all the people in yellow slickers rush to one side of the boat to point and shout and wonder how to tell their friends about the day they saw a whale. And the day you saw a whale? It's today. Oh, I love this one. It's all about the longer you live, the more you learn about how you should do things and how you didn't do things the way you should have done things. But now you'll eventually learn how to do things. And oh, let's just keep trying. Banana School. The day I learned that monkeys, as well as chimps, baboons, and gorillas all peel their bananas from the other end and use the end we peel from as a handle, I immediately made the switch. I wasted no time in passing this wisdom on to family, friends, and even strangers, as I am now passing it on to you, a tip from the top, the banana scoop, the inside primate lowdown. Now I promise, once you try it, you will never go back except to regret the long error 
of your ways. And if you do not believe me, swing by the local zoo some afternoon with a banana in your pocket and try peeling it in front of the cage of an orangutan or a capuchin monkey. And as you begin, notice how the monkey stops what they're doing, if they are doing anything at all, to nod their brotherly approval through the bars. Better still, try it out on the big silverback gorilla. See if you can get his dark eyes to brighten a bit as the weight of him sits there in his cage, the same way Gertrude Stein is sitting in that portrait of her she never liked by Picasso. Now, I bet you never knew that bugs have nationality, identity issues. Here is Irish Spider. It was well worth traveling this far just to sit in a box of sunlight by a window in a cottage with a steaming cup of tea and to watch an Irish spider waiting at the center of his dewy web, pretending to be just any spider at all, a spider without a nation, but not fooling me for a minute. Oh, I love this one. I found this at the last minute. When I was flipping through the book for poems I hadn't flagged to read. The Card Players. <laughs> I'm glad Cezanne was not here in Key West to set up an easel and paint the card game I was in last night, unless he was really good at depicting despondency. Cezanne once said that a single carrot, if painted in a completely fresh way, would be enough to set off a revolution. I'll bet he was sitting in a cafe that day where such observations are usually made. But if I had been sitting in that cafe across from Cezanne, I would have quit. Ooh, maybe if Bugs Bunny were in charge of things. And I would have described in a fresh way how the famous rabbit might be portrayed using a carrot to point the mob at the Bastille. Beer and chips and more beer and chips were served at the poker table. But no carrot soup, a staple on every menu in the bunny rabbit stories of Beatrix Potter, and a dish that would have warmed me inside and out the way a good soup does, and made me feel much better about losing all my money. <laughs> and then some. But at least now I have found the answer to the old question of who would you invite to your ideal dinner party? <laughs> Paul Cezanne, Bugs Bunny, Beatrix Potter. <laughs> and okay. Maybe, at the last minute, Gore Vidal. Oh boy, bring on the entree to that party. 
a terrible beauty. Now this line is a quote from T.S. Eliot, which I'm sure many of you will remember. April is the cruelest month. And Billy Collins' poem follows. If you happen to miss this year's cruelest month competition, it began with all 12 contestants taking the stage together in the order of the calendar year, each dressed in outfits that sang of their personalities. March, wind blown and wet with rain, October resplendent in orange and red. Many wondered why April, a perennial loser, would even bother to show up always smiling, daffodils embroidered on her bodice. Some blamed it on a poem she'd read somewhere. Others followed her early elimination. August, with zinc slathered on her nose. December, looking like uh, the mother of God. It must be said that no one was surprised when the tuxedoed man with the microphone finally announced this year's winner. <laughs> the same as every year since the beginning. Even though she shivered during the swimsuit part and stumbled when asked how she planned to change the world. February was the obvious choice. I mean, the Super Bowl's over by then, and spring's a mile away. What could be crueler? As one guy put it. And that was about it. Oh, except for the coronation. There she stood, the only month on the stage, crying a few chilly tears a thin smile on her frozen lips. Then she bent her knees a little so as to be less tall, and some official placed on her head her latest dripping silvery crown of ice. Hawaii. As you and I walked through the palm forest of W.S. Merwin, our guide was telling us how it began in an abandoned pineapple grove and that the soil now uh, without nutrients had to be revived before anything else would grow. The palms came from all over the world, he said. And anyone who worked here had to know their Latin names by heart. The immense forest was hard to see for the ranks of individual trees. But back home this morning, you can't miss the four Chinese red pots on the back deck with the young palms sprouting from the seeds you picked up from the litter of seeds of the forest floor. The ones you showed me on our flight home, wrapped up like little mummies in paper towels. This is not how the pig got his curly tail or how the zebra got its stripes, but it is how we happen to have some of the work of W.S. Merwin growing here in Florida, in addition to his other major works, lined up in some rough order on a high shelf inside. And now the emperor of ice cubes. Three small nondescript shorebirds, probably sandpipers, investigating a, plonk, a clump of dry seaweed in the tide line, 
another one racing along the water's shifting edge, legs thin as pencil lead, scissoring back and forth in the wet sand. I might have left it at that, a beachgoer's morning take, if an ice cube I tossed hadn't landed near them, and if one of them did not start pecking and even sipping at it while rebuffing the others if they neared the prize in the sand. What would a pecking bird make of this frozen curio beyond something cold to peck at? Did it fall from space? Would it remind the bird of its second home in the Arctic, where sandpipers migrate, flying mostly by night, with lots of ice to peck at on arrival? Imagine a bird missing the cold while pecking at an ice cube as it melted in the Florida sand. In the end, it hardly mattered if or what the bird was thinking. The bottled beer in the igloo cooler, source of the magical cube where many other ice cubes lay gathered, was still very cold. And it all seemed framed for me, this bigger seascape, when I lean back to look, nothing but pale blue sky. Clouds pushed around in the wind and bright white waves rolling over one another, then breaking on the sand. And now, my funeral. <clears throat> After the eulogies and this and that and a blessing and whatever follows, as pedestrians outside walk along under the leaning steeple on their way to this place or that, there will come a moment when everyone will have had quite enough. Then the fox will tap a music stand with his bow and lift his violin and the badgers will raise their horns to their snarling badger lips ready to play what is required and the bear will gently set his paws upon the upright base <clears throat> and their playing will accompany everyone down the aisles and outdoors into the weather of the sky, whatever it may be, and a block or two south, then around a corner to a bar with a neon beer sign in the window. And its interior will be a greeting full of blue shadows with a streak of late morning light so that everyone is glad to be alive and sorry I couldn't be there. And it's even okay if the bartender turns out to be a horse. And as for me, gliding off into space, all I would ask as my final wish is that you refrain out of respect from shouting over the heads of others, now two or three deep at the bar. When did the cow sell this place? Wait your turn, then order up. You know, today is no different in that regard. And it is quite appropriate that I read for you this next poem. The Pregnant Man. A man is pregnant. Oh, he doesn't know he's pregnant. 
but unlike the other men wearing caps at the shady table outside a cafe, he wants to give birth to something that is alive, even if it's only a short poem breathing in and out. A girl poem or a boy poem, it wouldn't matter to his mighty love. Look at him now playing cards while the old waiter goes about his business. And now, finally, architecture at 3.30 a.m. Brunicelli is asleep in Florence. Christopher Wren is snoring in a corner of London. Lewis Sullivan is curled up somewhere in Chicago. Only Dagwood is awake at this hour in his bathrobe, in the kitchen, refrigerator door open, pickle jar under one arm, the mayonnaise balanced on a free elbow about to construct another phenomenal tower of a sandwich. I don't care that no one under 55 will know who Dagwood is. And no one over 55 will remember him. Dagwood is still standing in the Bumstead kitchen, bathed in refrigerator light, knowing his hunger will be appeased, but not before he labors, along with all the other geniuses under gravity's singular law. That ring you heard, it wasn't me. It was the phone in the office where I'm secretly hiding so I can read to you. There are just so many people here at, at uh, Story and Song. And you know what? All of them, I've got my mask down below, all of them properly covered. Now, I did want to do one thing before we go away and show you something I'm proud of. I don't care how you voted. That is none of my business. I'm not going to tell you how I voted. But I want to tell you what Vicky gave me when I dropped by the supervisor's office to deposit my ballot and watch it go into the ballot box. I got a sticker that's so precious, I haven't unpeeled it from the backing yet. I hope and pray that everyone watching this today will get one of these stickers by hook or by crook. I voted 20. 20, the presidential election. And now, until I see you next, which won't be that far away, on Friday, I'll be reading some prose instead of poetry.